We're in a series right now calling The Power of Tongues. <clears throat> the Power of Tongues. If you were here last week, uh, you will know where we are. If you weren't here last week, if you're online, you're not sure where we were, just give me, let me give you four factors that we covered last week that is important to understand before we continue on this morning. <clears throat> I shared last week how the, the gift of tongues is really based on the proper foundation. There are too many believers in churches today that belong to churches that have dismissed the gift of the, or the gifts of the Spirit, even this one particularly, um, because of maybe perhaps some of the controversy that it's stirred up, and as a result of that, people have just rejected it. Maybe they, perhaps they believed a certain doctrinal slant that says in 1 Corinthians 13 that, that tongues will cease and prophecy will cease, but love will never fail. Um, and they think, well, there you go. <clears throat> uh, that's the reason why we don't believe it's for today anymore. Well, if you really study that out, and I shared this last week in last week's message, that that which is perfect will come is not referring to the canonization of all the scripture. It's referring to Jesus coming back again for the church. When we as people that prophesy and operate in the gifts of the spirit depart, we don't need to prophesy and speak in tongues in heaven. All right, they will, they will cease. All right, so that again is one of the reasons why some people dismiss it for today. It's important that we base our doctrinal beliefs on the foundation of two things. Number one, Jesus Christ is Lord. And I can't overemphasize how important that is for us to understand that Jesus is more than just your savior. He needs to become your Lord. The word Lord means master or ruler, owner, if you will. How many know that when you were saved, Jesus bought you with his blood? You are no longer your own, the scripture says. We've been bought at a price. We've been bought with the blood of Jesus, amen? That means that our bodies no longer belong to us. Our bodies are now the temple of the Holy Spirit, correct? Okay, we're owned, we're owned and operated by God if we're willing to submit and surrender to him. But he needs to be that Lord in our lives. Amen. How many know that some, somebody, if you own something, you have control over that, don't you? Yeah. Don't you? Yeah. It's one thing to be a steward of something. It's another thing to be an owner of something. Amen. And so God is not stewarding us. He owns us. And he has the right to speak into our lives. He has the right to give us what he wants and do with us as he wants. Can you say amen? Amen. Some of you, that, that is a big part of growing up in Christ. If you think that you're in control of your own life and you can do whatever you want to do, all you have is Jesus in your back pocket as your fire insurance, I got news for you. That's not enough. As a matter of fact, you can live a wrong life, and I pray and hope that that's enough to get you to heaven. But I, I've heard somebody say before, if Jesus is not Lord of all, he's not Lord at all. I think it's just a sobering thought to think about right there. You know, again, Romans 10 tells us this. It says, if you confess Jesus Christ as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Lord. And that's just not a title. That's a description of who he is in your life. He's Lord. Is he Lord of your life? Amen? Come on. Is he Lord of your life? Okay, secondly, it's, it's important, another factor we established last week is that the gift of tongues, and by the way, if Jesus is Lord, and we do base our lives on the foundation of God's word, then we're going to be open to everything that God promises us in this, in this Bible. Amen? Amen? You don't have the luxury to pick and choose what you like and don't like. <laughs> Hello? You can talk to me. It's okay. All right, so... What God's word tells us is that tongues is a gift from God to his church. And we looked at that last week as well. Um, and we see that in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. The third thing I laid down last week is that this language of tongues comes out of our, the overflow of our spirit. It's not, it's not a gift that comes from here. It's not something that you memorize. It's not something that you rehearse. It's not something that you learn. It's not up here. Tongues is manufactured in here, your spirit. Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things. So he talked about the overflow of your spirit is where the, the, this gift flows from. And we got to learn to discern between the spirit and the flesh. 
We gotta be more spirit-led than flesh-led. Can you say amen? amen? I think it's so important that as the church, we're growing in maturity and understanding that we are spiritual beings that have a soul and live in a body. But the real you is spirit. Amen? Amen. You're a spirit being. God created you. God gave you a new spirit when you asked him to come into your life. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if any man or woman be where? In Christ. He or she is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. So you've got this new nature, your spirit, that is now in Christ. If any man be in Christ. So think about that because I'm going to bring that together in a bit. You are a new creation. You've got a new spirit. It's perfect, sealed by the spirit of God. It's righteous in every way. Glory to God. That's your spirit. That's who you are. That's your new identity in Christ, in him. The fourth thing that you need to understand in that is, and that we laid down last week, is that the gift of tongues has two applications. And this, again, is really important. This is where a lot of people get confused and they dismiss the gift of tongues altogether because they only think, if they do believe that the gift of tongues is for the church, they say, well, it only belongs in the corporate setting where God gives a gift to one or two people. They speak out in tongues, and then the gift of interpretation of tongues, which is listed in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, you have to read that to understand that, that there is the gift of interpretation of tongues, that that has to also be in operation in the church when that gift of tongues is given out. And if there isn't anybody, then remain silent. And, and what has happened as a result of that is that it's just kind of been limited to the corporate setting. But I'm here to tell you that according to the word of God, and I'll show it to you, that it isn't just for the corporate setting, but that it's also for the personal setting as well. And so it has two applications, corporate and personal, all right? And again, I, I could get into that all over again, but that was last week. So please, you can listen to the message. We put them up on our website. You can always watch it again and again to get it. Okay, so that's, that's important. Now, let's talk this morning about the benefits of the personal use of tongues. Why does God want to give us tongues? And if it is for everybody, how do we, how do we use it? How, how, how does it happen? How, how do we release it? And that's important to understand this. Okay, so I want to give you three purposes for the purpose of, of personal tongues. And, and again, I reflect back to 1 Corinthians 14, before we get into these, uh, verses 27 and 28. The Apostle Paul, writing to the church at Corinth, was helping explain to them the operation of tongues in the church. He talked about prophecy and he talked about tongues and how it is to be expressed in a public setting like this because they were really dysfunctional. The church at Corinth was really kind of messed up. They were kind of disoriented. They were, dis they were out of order in a lot of ways and just kind of a free for all. And Paul had to kind of bring some alignment and some order back into that church so they just didn't do anything willy nilly. They, they actually had structure to their services because what was happening was people would just you know, speak in tongues you know, randomly speak in tongues, but nobody there to interpret what was being said. And he said, what, what's the point of that, you guys? It, it's not helping anybody. It's distracting. Nobody understands what you're saying. So that, look at what he says. He gives instruction in verses 27, 28. If anyone speaks in a tongue, let there be two or three at the most, three, and each in turn, and let one interpret. That's with the gift of the interpretation of tongues. But if there is no interpreter, let him keep silent in the church. Now watch this. And let him speak to himself and to God. So Paul helps us understand that this is not just a gift that God gives one or two people just for the public use. He also has given it to individuals for personal use. Okay, so again, you can listen to last week. Let's, let's pick this up now. So the personal use of tongues there are three benefits to praying in the spirit. Number one, praying in tongues encourages you. Praying in tongues encourages you. Again, in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, look at verses two to five. The apostle Paul says, 
For he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God. For no one understands him. However, in the spirit, he speaks mysteries. But he who prophesies speaks edification, exhortation, and comfort to men. He who speaks in a tongue edifies himself. But he who prophesies edifies the church. And then Paul goes on to say, I wish you all spoke with tongues. So just stop there and understand that what Paul is saying is, is that in a corporate setting, it's so important that whatever message is being released can be understood by the collective body that is hearing it. And prophecy designed by God is released in gifts that God gives to the church that when somebody prophesies, they're speaking exhortation, edification, and comfort to those that are hearing. As a matter of fact, and again, we won't get into the whole teaching of prophecy, uh, as a matter of fact, we're teaching that right now in a, in a five-week class here at the church on Wednesday evenings for people to learn and to understand. In New Testament, prophecy is for edifying, building up, encouraging, exhorting, comforting the church. It's the testimony of Jesus according to Revelation chapter 20. So it's so important that you understand that. But what Paul's saying is that if you speak in a tongue and there's no interpretation of the tongue, it's not going to edify, exhort, or build up anybody. But what he is saying is this, if you use tongues for your personal use, it will edify yourself. Look at what Jude verse 20 says. In Jude, the book of Jude, it's the last book before the book of Revelation. It says in verse 20, but you, beloved, he's speaking to the church, but you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. So, Again, two occasions where God's word says that when we pray in the spirit, we are literally using God's power to edify or build up is another way of saying edify, to build up, to edify, to encourage ourselves in the Lord. Now, how many know if there's ever a day that we need to get built up, edified, and strengthened is today? My goodness, you look around, you see how much turmoil and hardship and frustration and anger and offense is happening. I mean, we all know the division that this whole COVID thing has stirred up and the vaccinations and non-vaccinated and it's just a mess and people are just angry at one another and households are being split and divided, let alone, you know, businesses and churches. It's just, it's just crazy. And you can be found in that place of despair and, and, and hardship and discouragement. And, you know, maybe you got a loved one that doesn't want you around them if you're not vaccinated. And, you know, it's just this division going on and you can get so down and so discouraged and so hurt. And how do you deal with that? Well, we all know that God gives us, you know, his spirit for for, for, you know, to, to, to understand God's word. We can build ourselves up on the word of God. We can praise him, amen. We can worship him, glory to God. God gives us the, the ability to do that. And by the way, church, don't wait for you to feel good before you praise God. You gotta learn how to get past the emotions and walk by faith and say, even though I don't feel like it, I will magnify the Lord. I will lift up my hands in his name. I will open up my mouth and bless him. I will praise him. And you make it your choice to rejoice. Amen. Amen. It's, a, it's so important you do that. Okay, now we've got those things and we understand those things and most believers and Christians, hey, agree with that. But here's God saying, I've given you another tool, another way of building yourself up in your holy faith that you don't become so discouraged and, and angry and frustrated that you give up on people or give up on church. You gotta learn how to build yourself up by praying in the spirit. Amen. Now, let me help you understand that concept because praying, he says, praying in the Holy Spirit. Well, <clears throat> remember, praying in tongues, what Paul said was, he said this in 1 Corinthians 14, again, he says this in verse 14 and 15, he says, for I, if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. In other words, it's unknowledge, I don't know what I'm saying. What is the conclusion then? I will pray with 
the Spirit. And by the way, that with the Spirit is the small s. That's talking about your spirit. I will pray with my spirit. Not my head, my spirit. I will pray with my spirit. And I also will pray with my understanding. So that when I'm praying, I know what I'm saying. But I'm going to pray with both. I'm going to learn how to shift from the what I know I'm saying to what I don't know is saying, but it's coming out of my spirit. He says, and I will also pray with you. I will sing with the spirit and I also will sing with the understanding. Here's what you need to also appreciate. Even though you're singing or praying, I should say, with your spirit, Jude says you're praying in the spirit, capital S, Holy Spirit, Remind you again, church, that as a believer in Jesus Christ, your spirit has been redeemed. You have a brand new spirit that you are now living. You're an eternal being. You're the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. You are holy under the Lord. You have got this renewed life now on the inside of you. That's the real you. But don't forget where you are. You are in Christ Therefore, when you pray with the Spirit, you are praying in the Spirit, capital S. Amen. You've got to understand the correlation between your Spirit and the Holy Spirit as a born-again believer. And not only that, but as someone who's submitted to and surrendered to the fullness of God's Spirit in your life. Amen. Praise God. You're, you're, you're in Christ. Remember, therefore, if any man be in Christ. Now, can I just encourage you with this? The word Christ is the word anointing. You know that, right? You know that that, that, that wasn't Jesus' last name. Right? Some of you are going like, it, it isn't? No, it's not. It wasn't Mr. and Mrs. You know, Joseph and Mary Christ had a baby and named him Jesus. That wasn't their last name. That name Christ means, it's, it's also the word Messiah in the Hebrew. In the Greek, it's Christ, but it means anointed one. The anointing. What Jesus came to do, he, and it says this in Luke 4, he says, he says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor, to heal the brokenhearted, to open up prison doors for those who are bound. Right? He, he explained the reason why he came, but it wasn't in his own natural ability. It was the anointing of the Holy Spirit in his life. So don't forget, church, that you and I are in Christ. That means that we are in the Spirit, and we need to operate in the Spirit. Glory to God. You know, church, listen to me. How many are, would you call yourself a Christian? <laughs> Some of you are not sure. Is this a trick question? Okay, yes, you are. Now, not, not everybody that calls himself a Christian is a Christian. You know that, right? Because sometimes the name is just a title that we loosely use. You know, I go to church, that makes I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a Christian. No, it doesn't make you a Christian. You know, being in a church doesn't make you a Christian any more than being in a, you know, a, a hospital makes you a doctor. You know, or being in a you know, garage makes you a mechanic. You know, it, just being in places doesn't make you anything. What makes you a Christian is, do you have the Christ one on the inside of you? Have you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Okay, so the Bible tells us in the book of Acts that the first time the, new, the followers of Jesus were called Christians was in Antioch. And the reason why is because they recognized them as these, these, these little Christs, these little anointed ones. They, they, they knew what Jesus did and how he raised the dead and how he preached the gospel and how he healed the sick. And, and all of a sudden, the church was doing the same thing Jesus was doing. And they just said, as a nickname, hey, you guys are little anointed ones. You're, you're, you're Christ-like. That's what the word Christian means. So let's understand, church, that if we are truly Christians, we are to be walking in the anointing of God's Holy Spirit. Amen? We are. And so... <clears throat> Praying in the Spirit is praying, praying with your spirit in the Holy Spirit that is going to bring edification and build you up and encouragement in your life. I, I, I just, I, you need that, amen? Now, let me just say this. Let me ask you this question. If speaking in tongues is a means 
for personal edification and faith building in your life, why would God limit that to just some believers and not all believers? Here's the answer. He wouldn't and he doesn't. It's for everyone. He wants you built up. He wants you edified. Some of you that are living depressed, discouraged lives, pray in the spirit. Pray in the spirit. Every day, everywhere you go, if you're driving down the street, you're praying in the spirit. You're washing the dishes, you're praying in the spirit. Amen. You're, you're, you're showering, you're praying in the spirit. Amen. Wherever you are, you're praying in the, yeah, I mean, just get you out of that depressed rut. Glory to God. Because the devil wants to keep you there. The devil wants to anchor you there. The devil just wants to do everything that he can to rob you of God's love, God's joy, God's peace, God's deliverance. He wants to just keep you trapped in a rut of despair. But praise God, don't give him that satisfaction, church. Learn how to operate in the spirit like this. And I guarantee you, you'll see yourself built up and strengthened in your, in, 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 and encouraged. Number two, good benefit of praying in the spirit is that tongues helps us pray more effectively. How many have ever had a burden to pray for something or you're, you're in a situation and you need to pray about it and, and, you don't, and you just don't seem like you really know how to pray? You're just saying, God, help but you really don't know the details. You don't know the people behind the scenes. You don't know all the intricacies and the ins and outs of all that's going on. And you're really limited in your understanding of how to effectively deal with this in prayer. Come on, have you ever been there? Yeah, yeah. Haven't we all? We all have. We've all come to that place. It's like, God, I don't know what to say. I don't know how to pray. I just, God, help. Okay, this is the answer. Watch this in Romans chapter eight. Look at verse... 26, Romans chapter 8, <clears throat> verse 26. It says, likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses. How many would agree that your limitation of knowledge and understanding of what to pray is just, your, it's a weakness that we have? We don't know everything. We don't know all the details about stuff. Okay, we're weak, we're limited in that way. But... The Holy Spirit helps us, for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us. Now, don't forget, the word intercession means a mediator, a go-between. Okay, so like Jesus, for example, the Bible describes him in Hebrews as our intercessor, a lot of times, if you're not you're familiar with that terminology and you think of just prayer intercession, you'll think of Jesus up there in heaven praying for us. He's not. What it means is that he already became the go-between between between God and man to reconcile us together in a new covenant relationship. And he forever will be our intercessor, our mediator, our arbitrator, if you will, between two parties that were separated and we know because of sin, but Jesus became sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him through faith in him. And as a result of that, he brings us together. He's our intercessor. See what I mean? He's our go-between. <clears throat> the Holy Spirit becomes our go-between in moments of weakness when we don't know how to pray. Because how many know, church, and this is so important to understand, prayer is essential for God to fulfill his will on the earth. You need to know that. You say, well, is prayer, you know, I, I don't pray very much. You know, I, 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 I just don't know how to pray. I don't know what to say. I, well, you're really, really limiting what God wants to do in your life if you don't pray. Prayer is absolutely essential to God's will being done in your life. Why is that so important? Because when God created Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden before they fell in sin, he said to them, he blessed them, and he said, now you take dominion on the earth. He created mankind to be God's representation on the earth so that God's will and plan on the earth would be done. That was God's initial design until sin got in the way. <clears throat> and then the whole need was mankind to be reconciled back to the Father and to be restored back into a place of authority. I don't have the time to all get into this this morning. This would be long, but please understand that. God, has, God wants you in a place of authority on the earth in order to see his will done. 
That's why Jesus taught his disciples how to pray in Matthew chapter six, when his disciples said, Lord, teach us how to pray. You know, isn't it amazing that the disciples followed Jesus for all that time and they saw him cast out demons, they saw him heal the sick, they saw him, you know, cleanse the lepers. He, he, saw, he saw all these, these miracles that they saw and then instead of saying, Jesus, teach us how to open up blind eyes. Teach us how to raise the dead. Uh, uh, teach us how to cleanse the lepers like you do. They didn't. They said, teach us how to pray because they recognized the amount of time Jesus spent with the Father in prayer, all that time that Jesus had that intimate relationship and walked with God in prayer, that as a result of all that, he was doing the miracles. They knew where the source was. They knew why. And that's why, church, I think it's important that you and I get back to a place of prayer where we understand this is vitally important. We need to pray. So Jesus teaches his disciples to pray. And he says this, we're all familiar with it. We would call it the Lord's Prayer. He says, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Then watch this. Your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Too many Christians think God is controlling everything. He's sovereign over all. If it's going to happen, if it's, it's his will. If it doesn't happen, it's his will. Que sera, sera, whatever will be, will be. Wrong. God has a plan, but he's not going to override people's will. He calls us as the church to enforce his will, to pray his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And if we're not praying God's will, it's not going to get done. Why? Because he's given us the jurisdiction of earth. Are you following me? The scripture says the heavens, the Lord's, but the earth he's given to the children of men. This is our domain. We're supposed to have dominion here in order to order, enforce God's will on earth as it is in heaven. So we need to pray. But the problem is we don't know how to pray. We don't know what to say. Now, the more that you get into the word of God, the more you find out what God's will is, the more that you become more knowledgeable, the more that you can become more strategic and more effective in prayer. And we all need to learn, grow, and understand God's word in order to pray more effectively. However, there will always be those times where we don't know how we're going to pray. Have you ever had a prayer burden? God giving you a prayer burden? You just, God wants you to pray about it. And you go, what am I supposed to pray about? And he says, just pray. Well, about what? Okay. This is where this works. And this is, this, this is amazing. So he says, he goes on to say, again, Romans chapter eight, he, the spirit himself, makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now, let me give you the breakdown of those two words, groanings. The word groaning simply means sounds. Sounds. He will give you sounds which cannot be uttered. The word uttered there in the Greek is the word al al alaletos. Alaletos, all right? And it means expressed in words. In other words, <clears throat> the Holy Spirit will help us by giving us intercession with groanings or sounds that cannot be expressed in words. In other words, you're not gonna be able to articulate it in your language, a known language, so it's not, it's not just a matter of, okay, God, inspire me to say the right words. He's going to say, listen, I'm just going to quicken in your spirit the ability to speak and give sound to groanings, if you will, that cannot be articulated or expressed in the modern language that is known. Yeah, exactly. Wow. Praise God. Yeah. Why? So that we can pray his will. Because right. look at what verse 27 says. <clears throat> Now, he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he, he makes intercession for the saints, which is us, the church, according to the will of God. Praise God. You want to pray God's will every time you pray? Pray in the Spirit. <laughs> pray in the Spirit. That's God. That's the Holy Spirit praying the very mind of God for your situation. How many would like that? So if speaking in tongues is a means of more effective prayer, why would God limit that to only some believers and not to every believer? Yeah, that's right. The answer is he wouldn't. Yeah. 
and therefore he doesn't. God gives us tongues for edification. God gives us tongues for more effective prayer. And the third point is God gives us tongues, personal use of tongues, because it is a weapon for spiritual warfare. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, I could really, really, I could do a series on this. And, and, and I would like to maybe delve into this a little bit more in time here. <clears throat> and, I, and I feel it's, it's not that far away. But for now and today, let me just give you some thoughts here. You need to understand, church, that we're all in a spiritual battle. <coughs> Excuse me. If you think that this is just a natural world and one day it's all going to be over and then we'll get into the spiritual kingdom of heaven and then we'll see it all. Okay. You're short-sighted. You, you don't see what really is reality. There is a spiritual realm that we need to be aware of, okay? Yes, there's heaven. <clears throat> yes, there are angels among us. Praise God. I believe that even right now, if God was to open up our spiritual eyes, we would see a host of angels all around in this room right now. As a matter of fact, you can't see them, but just go ahead and wave at them. They're doing a great job. Thank you. Thank you for what you're doing because <clears throat> they're amazing. Okay, the Bible says he gives his angels charge over us. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him. So realize that there are angels among us, <clears throat> but there's also demons around us as well. Now, praise God for the angels that are keeping them at bay, but there might be a breach in the wall that you've allowed that, that the demonic can get in. And we gotta be aware of that, okay? But be aware of the fact that there's a real demonic realm, satanic realm, <clears throat> that the enemy is on the prowl. We know that in scripture, it tells us. In 1 Peter chapter, chapter 5, it says in verse eight, it says, be sober, be watchful or vigilant because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And then in verse nine, it says, but resist him steadfast in the faith. Praise God. So it re really requires us to be strong in faith to resist the enemy's tactics. And that's why it's so important that we pray in the spirit to build ourselves up on our most holy faith. Okay, so recognize the fact that we, there is a spiritual demonic realm. <clears throat> excuse me, in Ephesians chapter six, <clears throat> excuse me, we're all familiar with this passage of scripture perhaps, but this is, and this is a common one. Paul is again helping us understand this, this realm. He says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might and put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. That word wiles there simply means schemes or trickery of the devil. How many know that he's a schemer? Yeah. He, he's, a, he's, a, he's a deceiver. Yeah. He's a trickster. He's going to do everything he can to try to make you believe a lie. He's going to try to tempt you. He's going to deceive, try to deceive you. He's going to offend you. He's going to do everything he can to, to, to ruin you, all right? But don't be ignorant to his devices. That's what another verse says in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11. But we need to be careful, church, that we are mindful, vigilant, watchful of this demonic enemy that's on the prowl. He goes on to say, <clears throat> for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. In other words, we're not wrestling against people. The challenges that we're facing today, church, in our world today is a shadow of the real fight that's going on in the heavenly realm. And when I say heavenly realm, I'm, talk about, I'm not talking about the paradise realm of God's kingdom. I'm talking about, there are three heavens, by the way, you know that, right? There's the, there's the sky, that's one heaven. There's the, <clears throat> and the atmosphere, that's, that's the first heaven. The outer space, the universe, is the second heaven. That's what the scriptures talk about. And then the third heaven, of course, is that paradise realm of heaven where God is, all right? So when, it when we talk about battle, spiritual battle in heavenly realm, we're not talking about in the kingdom of heaven of, of where God is. We're talking about in the atmospheric realm around the earth. That's where, that's where the enemy is prowling. That's where he's looking for opportunity. That's where he's trying to get in. That's where he's trying to deceive. But the battle is happening in that atmosphere. And let me tell you this, what we're seeing on earth is a reflection or a shadow of that which is happening in the spiritual realm. And we think our enemy is our wife or our husband or our kids or our boss or the government. No, that's why we need to pray for the government because they can be under the influence of the spirit realm. If we're not careful, so can you. And we gotta be careful, church. So, so watch this now. 
he goes on to talk about putting on the whole armor of God, which I'm not gonna get into all these different pieces, but he talks about gird your, you know, well, first of all, let me just finish verse 12. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. There it is. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand the evil in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand, therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith with which you were able to quench all the fiery darts. Those are thoughts that the enemy tries to invade your mind with. You're not good enough. God doesn't love you. That person hates you. You should be offended. You know, the government is, you know, whatever. I mean, we just have all these thoughts that the enemy tries to throw in our mind. We need to have that shield of faith up all the time. Don't let it down. Don't let down your guard. Take up the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. We need to get the word of God in our mouths. Amen. Amen. Get it deep in your heart so that it comes out of your mouth. Glory to God. Okay, so those are great pieces of armor and we could expand on that a little bit more, but we don't have the time today. But then don't think that that's where it ends because verse 18 continues on describing the armor. And by the way, can I just stop and say this? The armor of God is not put on by imagining yourself dressing like a soldier. That's not how you put it on. You put on the armor of God by getting a revelation of God's truth concerning righteousness, salvation, faith, getting into the word of God. That's how how you equip yourself in the word. Can you say amen? Amen. There's too many people say, you know, I just imagine myself getting dressed in the morning and I'm ready ready for the day. Well... You can imagine all you want, but that's not going to do it. What's going to do it is when you get a revelation where faith comes by hearing and hearing by the revelation of God's word. Amen? Okay, let's continue on. Look at verse 18. Here is an addition to the armor. Praying always. It's a continuation. It's not a new thought. It's a continuation of what Paul's saying in putting on the whole armor of God. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit. You see that? In the spirit. Being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Okay. (coughs) God gives us the spiritual protection and and the weapon of, of prayer. Praying in tongues is a spiritual weapon. Now, let me just ask you this question. By the way, mm, I wish I had more time. My goodness, it's one o'clock already. I need to finish. There's so many times where I've been praying, I need God, I need an answer. <clears throat> I, 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 you know, maybe it's a decision that you have to make. Do I move? Do I, do I stay? Do I sell? Do I buy? Uh, do I go? Do I come? What, 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 what am I supposed to be doing in this situation? Have you ever been there? There's times as well, maybe perhaps, that you're sick. You know, I remember in my life, <clears throat> and this is amazing. God, when God helps me pray in the Spirit, I realize, you know what? Why didn't I do that earlier? Because I pray in the Spirit, and all of a sudden, God reveals the answer to me quickly. You know, there's times where I was not feeling well, and I'm thinking I'm going to just tackle this illness by my own, you know, I'll throw a prayer out there. I'll quote a verse of Scripture over my life. I'll take my, you know, medication, whatever. But then God says, you know, pray. Pray in the Spirit. And next thing you know, I pray in the spirit and what took me three days to get to where I am takes three hours to get me out of it simply by praying in the spirit. It's amazing how God will rescue us and do things for us supernaturally when we engage in his anointing and his spirit in praying that way. I mean, I could give you story after story how many times where I I just, I didn't know what to do and and a decision needed to be made. And it was like, you know, have anybody ever had like brain fog where you just don't, you can't really put the parts together, your, your mind is kind of confused and what to do and how to do it. And, and, and so God just shows me how it's important that I, as I pray in the spirit, it's almost like the fog dissipates and I can see clearly what I'm supposed to do. The answer to my question, you know, the direction I'm supposed to go becomes way more clear. And I believe it's not, it's not just building myself up. That's a part of it. It's not just being more effective in my prayer. It's actually pushing away forces of darkness that are trying to come in on me. And by praying in the spirit, there's a dispelling of those things. 
and I'm able to be more focused and concentrated on what God's saying. That's what I'm talking about here. And so let me ask you this question. If speaking in tongues is a means of spiritual warfare, why would God limit that to only some believers and not to all? The answer is he wouldn't, and therefore he doesn't. Okay, I'm hoping I'm convincing you that tongues is for all of us. And these three benefits are for all of us. Edification, encouragement, absolutely. Praying more effectively, absolutely. Praying in spiritual warfare to overcome the battles that the enemy is attacking you with, absolutely. That's for you. So we can all speak in tongues. And I could share those verses all all over again that I shared last week, but you can get those by watching them again. But so why don't we then? Why don't we? Here's the reason. Is because God requires your will to do things in you and through you. As much as he wants to, he can't if you choose not to. So you have a will. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 14, 32, and the spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet. In other words, a prophet is somebody who conveys God's truth to edify, exhort, and comfort the church. But he has a will. He can either say it or he can withhold it. He can either shout it or he can whisper it. He can either say it in a certain language or in a different language, like known language, right? He has the ability to make choices and utilize his will and his body however he wants. You know, you see some people, I've had some people prophesy in years past, and they would get into the whole King James, you know, language, the Elizabethan. It's barely, I say, I saith unto thee, the Lord would have you say, and, and, you know, they're shouting it and, and, and act, you know, their hands are all over the place, and they're just so expressive. And then you go to them afterwards and you say, you know what, that was good, good word, but you didn't have to say it in Elizabethan. We don't speak that way today. And, uh, you know, you didn't have to get so emotional while you're, you know, you're spitting on people and you're hitting people beside you. You can calm yourself down and say it a little bit more of a gentler manner. Well, I can't. I mean, the Holy Spirit had me do that. No, he didn't. He gave you the word. You used your own language, your own voice, and your own body. And that's what you need to understand. And so when it comes to speaking in tongues, don't think that God's just going to possess you with his spirit and you're all of a sudden, it's like, Where would that come from? How did that happen? Okay, that doesn't happen like that. What ha- how it happens is <laughs> the spirit of God on the inside of you is, is, is operating inside of you where he's cooperating with you. And you have a choice to decide whether or not you want to release that or keep it, whether you want to say it or not, how you want to do things. So it's so important, church, that you understand that you've got a will and the Holy Spirit will cooperate with your will. <clears throat> now, let me wrap up. Let me wrap up. What must we do to receive this experience? Then how do we, how do, we do this? Okay, there's two things quickly. Number one is you must be willing to yield to the Holy Spirit. You have to be willing to yield to him. Surrender. Don't forget, he's Lord. You surrender to him and his will. 1 Thessalonians 5.19 says, do not quench the Holy Spirit. That's 1 Thessalonians 5.19. Don't quench the Holy Spirit. But Ephesians 5.18 tells us, don't be under the influence of alcohol, be under the influence of the Holy Spirit. We need to learn how to submit and yield ourselves to the unction and the prompting of the Holy Spirit, his influence on your life. If God wants you, if God is doing something in you, if God is impressing on you, if God is welling up in you, you need to cooperate with him. I always think of it as a dance. You know, have you ever danced with somebody? You know, somebody might have, take the lead, but you follow, right? You don't just stand there. <sighs> oh, okay, right? You work with them. You flow with them. You're dancing together. I'm not a good dancer, so don't look at me. So, but I'm just saying that you, you flow with the partner and that partner leads and you follow and that's how God operates. He partners with you and he, and he wants you to move with him and, and, and join him in this coordinated, cooperative life where he's leading and prompting and giving and you're, you're working with that and you're releasing that and you're flowing with that and you're, 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 you're this team. 
Okay. B, it's his unction, but your function. Get that. It's his unction, but your function. In other words, he may impress upon you and stir something up on the inside of you, but you have a choice to make again whether or not you're going to cooperate by utilizing your lungs, your vocal cords, your tongue, your mouth. He's not going to override that. You're going to have to open up and allow him access, right? You're, you're going to have to release that. Okay, so, and again, we, I could show you verse, but my time is really up. But in the book of Acts chapter 2, when they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, they began to speak. And I want you to know that, okay? Just as Paul said, I will pray in the Spirit, I will pray with the understanding. He had the choice. Remember when he said also to the Corinthian church, listen, if, you, if you're speaking in tongues but there's no one there to interpret, remain silent, speak to yourself and to God. In other words, you have control. Yes. Okay, let's stand together. Let's pray. For those of you that are home, I, I love, I'd love for you to join us right now. This is a moment where we're allowing God to stir in our hearts I want to encourage you with this. If you are not comfortable praying out loud, if you're not comfortable praising God out loud, you'll have a hard time with this because it requires verbiage. It requires a sound. And I would just encourage you right now where you're standing, we're just going to take a couple minutes. Right where you are, just lift your hands, close your eyes, just put away all distractions around you. Don't think about the person beside you or behind you or in front of you. Just think about God right now and praise Him. Use your natural language and praise Him. Pray to Him. Say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God, that you have saved me. Thank you, God, that you have given me your Holy Spirit. Lord, I submit and I surrender to you as Lord of my life. I give you permission, O God, to have your way in my heart. I know that I've maybe discarded some truths from your word, And I am sorry and I repent, but I allow you, Lord, to teach me and to train me and to help me, Lord, to grow and mature in the knowledge of your will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that I would have a walk worthy of you, fully pleasing you, being fruitful in every good work. And so, Lord, I submit my will to you right now. I love you and I praise you. I exalt you and magnify you. Come on, wherever you are, praise him. Get your hands up in the air, close your eyes, begin to praise him. Praise him, praise him, praise him. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Now, as you praise him, come on, let's just lift up our voices. Again, we're we're not talking to the person beside us. We're talking to the Lord. Hallelujah. Let's just praise him. Glory to God. And as you begin to praise him, your heart becomes more and more sensitive, more and more passionate, more and more in love with who he is. Glory to God. We love you, Lord. We magnify you. We praise you, Lord, today. Thank you, Lord, for saving me. Thank you, Lord, for saving me. Thank you, Lord, for all that you have for my life. I love you and I exalt you. Yes, as you begin to do that, your spirit now becomes more in tune with him. And as your spirit prays now, you're gonna pray in the spirit by allowing him to give you an utterance Uh, that is not expressed in words. You're going to be able to have this, this groaning, this sound, if you will, that you're releasing that's not in your known language. It is simply a sound coming out of your spirit. God doesn't need, listen, God doesn't need English to understand what you're saying. He speaks all languages and languages that are not even known to man. He knows what your spirit is saying. So if, even if it's a grunt or a groan or a sigh or something that comes out of you, it's coming out of your spirit. God hears it. God knows what he's hearing. So just release it. Ho, ha, ho, Jesus, ho. Come on, say that. Ha, if that's all you can do is one syllable, do it. Oh. Oh, ha. Ah. Now, as you do that and you're comfortable with that, 
let your spirit flow. It comes out in syllables. Come on, just let it flow. It's the spirit of the Lord. It's ministering through you. I know it sounds weird. Listen to me. Don't think it through too hard. That's the problem. We get our minds in the way. This is a spiritual thing. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke in tongues. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Some of you, you're thinking about the person beside you too, too much. Stop it. Think about God. <clears throat> For some of you, you're going to have to go home in your own private place and spend time with the Lord where you can't think of anybody else but just you and Him and do this. But get the head, get the mind, get the, get the rationale out of the way. Just release from your spirit. God understands your spirit. He knows where it's coming from. He knows what it means. And church, listen to me. It could be the answer to whatever you're going through right now. Don't hold it back. Father, I just pray right now for every person in this room, all those that are watching online as well. We just surrender our will to you and we thank you again, Lord, for the gift of tongues. It's powerful. It builds us up. We're more strategic and effective in our prayer life and we can push back the forces of darkness through using this as a spiritual tool in our arsenal. Thank you, God. Help us to do it more. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. We love you, church. Come on, praise him. Thank you, everybody online. We love you. God bless you. Join us again next week. We're going to open up the front area for anybody who would like to come for prayer. We have a prayer team standing by ready to pray for you. God bless you. You're dismissed. Hey, thanks for watching. For more content, hit subscribe and make sure to follow us on social media. You can also visit championcitychurch.com for more information.